Hello and Happy New Year. This is Roy Mitchell and this is Hibla Minute, episode 32, and the kickoff to season four. Thank you to everyone who has been part of this show since its inception. I am truly grateful for your support, input, and participation. Hibla Minute has gotten this far because of it. So here we are with season four. This show's guest, Doug Kramer, will talk about his life in and out of Scientology and how his YouTube channel, Dazed But Not Confused, has helped him and others to spread the word about the evilness of the cult Scientology. But first, happy birthday, Kala. Kala is a Milwaukee-based singer-songwriter, and on April 21st, he celebrates his birthday and the release of his album, Half. Check out his webpage and Instagram. The links are in the show's description. Thank you for the generosity of sharing your music, Kala, and happy birthday. And here's Moon Love Funk from his album, Colossus. Doug, thank you so much for coming on Hibla Minute. I'm really happy you're here. Before we get into the meat of this discussion, I want to ask you, how are you doing in the pandemic? How has it affected your life? You're talking about the situation that we're in, not Scientology particularly, right? Yeah, let's let's go big first and talk about California. Uh, you're in LA now. How is the pandemic affecting how you're living? Well, it's been positive and negative. It both inspired me to kind of do what I've been doing for the last eight months, seven or eight months, which is to talk out about Scientology on YouTube. And simultaneously, it's been kind of difficult, my friend, because I like, you know, like everybody to roam around the, the place like we used to. And since this pandemic hit, all the gyms have been closed out here in LA. I know it's different for different states, but LA in particular has been pretty restrictive. So that's had an effect on me not being able to go simply throw the weights around for an hour every day. I miss my acting class and my friends that I was able to go see. I feel disconnected from the world that I was living in before, hence the YouTube connection to get some connection. So it's been positive and negative. It's forced me and other people to rethink things and maybe to have a a moment to reflect. And at the same time, it's kind of uh, traumatizing. Let's get into the meat of this and talk about what the factors were that led you to Scientology. Okay, that's a pretty long story, but let me keep it succinct and brief if I can. My dad got into it when I was around nine or 10 years old. And the way that happened is he went down to work one day after seeing an ad in the newspaper that said, Dianetics, learn how to communicate better. He went down there, got into it in a single day and brought it back to the family and started telling my mom he found this new thing that he needs to do. I don't know exactly what happened that day, but he signed up for a lot of stuff, courses and auditing, I believe, that required a pretty large chunk of money that we didn't have. And he was going to borrow that and told my mother he needed to borrow that from his brother in order to be able to pay for these courses and this new thing that he just found. This freaked me and my mom out. We didn't know what he was talking about. We didn't know what Scientology was. And it caused a riff in the family for a while until he eventually got my mom into it. They then tried to double team me and get me into it. One of the ways that would happen is when I get in trouble in school, they would sit me down and basically say, would you like to be punished or locked off in your room for a month? Or would you like to just go down and take a course in Scientology for a week that we feel will really help you? I felt I was being manipulated. So I would always tell them, I would use very strong language to tell them, I don't want to do that. Give me the punishment. So this went on for a while. I eventually did start going down there and taking courses. I rejected it right away because I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what it was. I just wasn't into it. I didn't realize the significance of what I was actually getting involved in by simply going down there and taking these courses. I was incrementally being brainwashed without my knowledge. So long story short, in my early 20s, when I was at a vulnerable point in my life, that's when enough of Scientology had been indoctrinated into my mind through my childhood, where I was starting to take to these concepts and think there was something to it. And when I really needed it or needed someone 
Scientology was there for me to be captured or take take it up. So that's how I got into it. I seem to want to believe that Scientology isn't as popular as it was when you began it. No, they're not. They had their peak membership in the 80s, which was 100,000 members, despite telling you while you're in the Truman Show bubble that we have a 10 or 11 million. That's what I was told. In fact, the peak was 100,000 members in the 80s, and then it's been dying ever since. But that's not really the point. They could exist for a long time because they have about, I don't know what the number would be, but let's say a hundred or so whales. These are people that give them millions and millions of dollars to, to stay afloat and donate to the cult in addition to the choruses and stuff. So they can stay afloat with just these hundred members or so. Tom Cruise, of course, being one of them. God knows how much money he's given to them. So their membership is a front. They don't really necessarily need a lot of members and they've never had a lot of members but they can survive by duping X amount of really rich people because it's kind of a rich man's cult. And that's how they can stay alive and build all these buildings and stuff. So I don't think they're going to go any away anytime in the near future. They have plenty of money to keep surviving and keep brainwashing people and keep buying facilities to brainwash people that, you know, just walk in there innocently. So despite their membership definitely declining, like you said, it doesn't have a heck of a lot of impact on their ability to to survive financially. And then as far as the COVID thing goes, like any disaster, be it uh, Hurricane Katrina or 9-11, what they do is they, like a vulture, take advantage of a traumatizing situation for people. So they send out people called volunteer ministers. That's their PR front where they have Scientologists that dress up in yellow vests. They go out to these disaster sites and they do things called touch assists and they give water away, and they do things that get in the way of real help, but they're brainwashed, like I was, to think that they have a special technology to help people in trauma. That touch assist is where the Scientology volunteer minister, while people were suffering smoke inhalation problems in 9-11, while they really needed serious medical help in Katrina, etc. I know this sounds weird. Let me just give you a really quick example of so you can see how ludicrous it is. So while these people are struggling, they will lay them down on a bench and say, I'm going to do a process on you that's going to bring you into present time and help you out of this situation. And so they say, feel my finger, and they'll touch the body, and the person has to say, yes, okay, I feel your finger. The volunteer minister says, thank you. Feel my finger, and they touch another part of the body. There's a whole explanation as to what that stupidity uh, means to a Scientologist. But imagine if you're in a disaster, you need serious medical help, and a volunteer minister, a Scientologist in disguise in a yellow vest, is sitting there saying, feel my freaking finger. So that's what they do, man. So with this COVID thing, they have a whole PR scam and campaign on their website, video after video, showing in slick videos how... They, again, they're so deluded, they think they have this special spraying technology that's going to kind of get rid of the COVID. So they have these funny videos where they're spraying all this stuff in fire departments. They're spraying down uh, this place, that place, using this special COVID deleter. And they put out these slick videos saying, look at how we're helping during this disaster. It's a PR front. And the reason they do that is so you will be deflected from all the evil stuff they do when they're called out. And they say, wait a minute, we helped out 9-11. We did this. We gave water. Look at how we helped the community. So it's a way of recruiting new Scientologists as well. They've actually gotten a lot of people into Scientology through their trauma and through manipulating them when they're in a vulnerable or disaster moment. That's how they handle the COVID and everything else and, and any natural disaster. Me knowing this, when they, mm-hmm. a woman's pregnant, what she has to do if she's a time tolerant, all of these things that right. don't make any sense. Right. In your YouTube channel, you expose so much about Scientology, how your family got involved, how they created so much trauma and division amongst your family and other families. How connected to your family are you now? And are they still in Scientology? I have no connection with my family. I sort of had to kill them off in my mind as well as like in reality. I know that sounds bad, but I'll explain that in a little more detail. But first, let me just say they are still in Scientology. As far as I know, I'm sure my dad 
still is in it. He got to the top of the bridge called OT8. He's about as brainwashed and gone and, and robotic as you could possibly be. So his likelihood and ability to get out of it, he'd have a heart attack if he ever woke up to the situation he was in. So he's going to be in for life. I haven't communicated with him, so that's a guess, but I'm sure that's a situation. My mother never really was a Scientologist, even though she's done a lot of it. She just got manipulated and she has her own manipulation tactics as well. It's kind of complicated, but she basically took to it because my father did. He said, basically, if I don't get to do Scientology, if I don't get to borrow this money from my brother and take to this, I'm probably going to have to leave the family and get a divorce. So my mom made a decision that rather than reject what her natural instincts told her, something's wrong here, something's weird about Scientology, why does he want to borrow this money? She eventually decided... I'll just check it out and go along with it. I don't like the idea of having the whole family destroyed. So that's how she got manipulated into it. She's never really been a full-on Scientologist. My dad and myself have always had to kind of push her to go up the bridge and to take the courses and get her ass down there. It wasn't her thing. She's doing it just to hold on to the family, I feel. Despite that, she speaks, acts, and is a Scientologist. So even though the programming is more extreme on my dad, she's very much uh, locked into the same bubble of belief. So I'm sure they're both Scientologists. My sister never really took to it. There's me and my sister in the family. She's had ample auditing and courses, but long story short on that, she was the golden child, so she didn't kind of need the help that Scientology promised. I was the black sheep, the one always getting into trouble. So they felt I needed the most Scientology. So I was the more of the prime target for the brainwashing manipulation from my parents. They're controlling and i sort of had to leave them normally when you leave scientology your family and especially if you speak out about it like i am they have to disconnect from you and they will send you an order through the mail called an sp order or suppressive person order meaning you can't speak to us anymore you're evil and if you talk anything about scientology we're going to come after you so I never got that from my parents. I never got an answer to that. And the reason that I believe is because my parents aren't like totally evil or anything. They're just average people. If you met them, I believe deep down, they kind of do love me and they probably had to fight to not disconnect from me. So I give them, I give them kudos for that. At the same time, on the other side of the coin, they're super controlling and they kind of want to control me and the family, particularly my mother. So I think it's a, a dichotomy where they both didn't want to lose me and they always, always, always would be trying to get me back into Scientology in subtle, manipulative ways. That's why I had to take it upon myself to basically cut them out of my life, which is a reverse of what usually happens, because they were either going to get me back into Scientology because they can't think any other way. So all they, they don't even know that they're doing that. They just simply are Scientologists. I definitely need to be one. They can't believe I left. I'm definitely evil on their eyes, but they would be telling themselves, we love our son, so we're going to always leave the door open for him. It's kind of a sad situation, man. I, I have, or I had, not, not, not anymore because I processed it, but I had a lot of anger for my parents. I spent a lot of time calling them up and leaving messages on their answer machine, begging them to listen to me, to see what they're doing, to see the to see what, what's happening. And I also, unfortunately, threatened to kill him. And I did anything that I could to get their attention to snap out of this. And at the same time, I love them and I feel sorry for them. And I understand the trap that they're in. So it's this incredible emotional roller coaster that I had to deal with for about 10 years while they are carrying on with their lives, oblivious of the trauma and the danger that I'm in. So it's been a, it's been a trip, man. I want to talk about the concept of mm -hmm. rune, your rune in Scientology. What is it and why is it important for Scientology to find out what your rune is? Okay, a rune in Scientology is one of the first things that once you go down there, they're going to try to find on you. And the way that works is after you fill out their 200 question personality test, which is designed to get inside your mind and kind of throw you off balance, they use that test to take you into a room and they sit down and they basically ask you, what's the one thing in your life that if you could handle everything would be better? That's an opening question to try to get the person to open up and tell this stranger something that they would absolutely not want to say even to their most intimate loved one. And that is a way 
to find somebody's weakness or vulnerability, because we all have them, whether we're aware of them or not, and they're experts at finding that. That's what the ruin is. And then once they find the ruin, when they found mine, I was crying and breaking down. And they obviously found my dad's ruin because he took to it in a day. That's a way of then selling Scientology. So after they find your ruin, you offload, you have this cathartic experience unburdening yourself. They then look you right in the eye, kind of in a hypnotic uh, way. And with what they call tone 40, which means super intention. And they say Scientology can handle that. So that is something that the registrar, the Scientologist, and every Scientologist that sells Scientology is trained on how to manipulate a person by finding their vulnerability and then selling them a chorus and getting their ass in there. Um, it's heartbreaking when you talk about it. And, I, and your compassion for your family and your friends who are in it comes through in your, in your videos. You're not malicious or you're, you're a caring person. And you make it clear that while your, you and your father's room had nothing to do with being gay, Many of the people who are tricked into becoming a Scientology member get lured in because they want to believe it can change them. As a gay man, I appreciate you talking about this, especially because you're not gay. What is Scientology's take on queer people? Yeah, man. The, one, the reason this really bothers me is because, like you said, I don't have a problem with that. I personally think it's ridiculous. Uh, to eat. It just doesn't make any sense, the prejudice. So they have so many people in there, my man, that have been manipulated because they were promised that their auditing and their choruses will wipe the gay out of them. I mean, talk about evil. I, the reason I use that, that situation is because it's something similar to that that causes the same kind of emotional response from me, where there was nothing wrong with him, but he, like gay people, are manipulated to believe that there is something wrong with being gay. And just to give you a little more context on that, not only is there something wrong with it, L. Ron Hubbard has this thing called the emotional tone scale. And a long story short, one of those levels is called level 1.1, and that's called covert hostility. That's the worst level you can be at as a human being, according to Scientology. And they place people that are gay as covertly hostile, evil, manipulative, bad people. They're basically what you would call a sociopath in, in human language. That's his attitude on gays. So they have... So many people down there that have, I know have been manipulated into the cult and have spent the rest of their life, you know, thinking about how wrong they are and trying to audit it out using their auditing techniques year after year. You see how evil it is, man. This is what we're talking about, about with the ruin. They'll find somebody's vulnerability. And if someone doesn't feel comfortable about being gay or they think that's wrong in any way, they latch onto that in particular. And they can get many, many, have gotten many, many people in that way. And there's these rumors about celebrity Scientologists being gay. Are these people who are rumored to be gay, gay? Okay. I don't know about Tom Cruise. He could possibly be bisexual, possibly not. It's total speculation, but he has an unusual relationship with David Miscavige. He is kind of considered the number two in the hierarchy of Scientology. David Miscavige, the cult leader, being the top. And even though Miscavige despises Tom Cruise, he's also a psychopath like David. So they have this relationship where they think they're the two most powerful beings on the planet. So I don't know about his sexuality. John Travolta is the next one that somebody thinks of uh, based on that question you asked. And yeah, of course he's gay. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. The two that come to mind in a lot of people's minds are those two people. However, that's not necessarily what's keeping John Travolta in there, for example, he might not have too much of a problem with people realizing he's gay because he would have to have some awareness that that's already the perception that people have. So no big deal. There's other blackmail material that they would have on him. And there's other reasons that would be, I think, more important than just, oh, he doesn't want to leave, leave Scientology because he doesn't want the church to expose that he's gay. So it's not necessarily like that with these celebrity people. Part of the blackmail will be their sexuality. And you ask why, how they keep famous people in there. They keep them in through blackmail. When you do their auditing sessions, you think that you have priest penitent confidentiality when you're doing these psychotherapy sessions. You absolutely believe that. Only when you come out do you realize that they use everything that you told them, your deepest, darkest secrets in these auditing confession sessions. They absolutely will use it against you to crush you. So... If people wake up in Scientology, let's say John Travolta woke up. I don't think he's going to. There's a lot of um, 
there's a lot of trauma he'd have to unpack and come to terms with. And I think he's going to be in forever or he might slide away, but they would have lots of blackmail material on him and other people and other famous people. And that's what keeps him in there. In fact, to go deeper into that, that's a big purpose of Scientology is to simply get blackmail material on famous and powerful people so that they can be controlled and influence those below them. Wow. Okay. Are you ready for a story? Because I'm going to tell you my cult experience, and I'd like to know if you see any resemblance to the techniques and methods of Scientology. Are you ready, Doug? I am ready, my man. I think I've always been interested in the concept of cults, maybe not even in high school yet, but I was young, and this friend was going to go away for the weekend. I was very excited about it. I couldn't go. He told me, no, you can't go. And so after it, he came back, and of course, he wasn't supposed to tell me, but we're kids. And I, come on, tell me, tell me, tell me. He finally told me the experience. And that's what I'm going to tell you. So he was taken into like church basement. All the windows were locked up, blacked out, so you couldn't see the sun. You didn't know what time it was. Clocks were taken away. They were given food, but never like, this is lunch, this is dinner. Whenever they wanted to eat, they could eat. So it was like they were really unaware of time. They were disconnected from it constantly kept busy, maybe losing a bit of sleep. And they were given an orange and they were told, look at this orange, get to know this orange. This is your orange. Understand every part of it. Understand, make it like inside out. You can't break it or anything, but keep this orange. And then they took the orange away. And so they went through this thing all weekend. And then at the end of the weekend, they were they went into a room full of the orange and said, find your orange. And of course, these are young kids and they're going like, what? Like, what? What am I doing? <laughs> so they're looking for their oranges. And he said it was really incredible, this experience. And he, I mean, for him, this was a great experience. It was cathartic. It was like, oh, my God, we, we shared so much in this weekend. It was so private and personal. It was all of a sudden at the end of this weekend, a door opens up. The sun shines in. In come these people with, I think, music or celebratory or I don't know what it was, but it was ecstatic. And when he told me this as a kid, I just went, oh, that sounds not like fun. It doesn't sound good at all, except for the chocolate bars. Nothing appealed to me. I think that's a cult or at least a method of mind control. Is there anything similar that Scientology, can you see references to Scientology in that story? Totally. Totally. That's very funny, by the way. I mean, that must be how ludicrous Scientology looks and the choruses and stuff from the outside, too, because what you're describing is is Mind Control 101. That's exactly how it happens, be it Scientology with the Oranges, TM, or a Landmark Forum. They all do exactly what you're talking about. From what you described, there's sensory deprivation in the fact that you are locked off in a room. Since I don't know about that, let me give you an example of what triggered as soon as you said that story about landmark they will get people up there and have a cathartic release and tell very personal stuff and have a breakdown in front of the audience they won't allow the audience members to go to the bathroom except for here and there so they suppress their ability to pee and they are put into a three-day intense seminar where their focus of attention and their ability to move around freely and their sense senses are restrained to put it simply that can cause a cracking or a breaking of your mind and then you can go like this i experienced this many 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 times in scientology auditing for example since you're going beyond the mind's natural capacity and you're putting stress and strain on it this is a way to induce that ecstatic state of mind that you're talking about or hypnotism or whatever you want to call it this cathartic release and the techniques that you just described with that orange, he would have had a major experience like you had under those kind of conditions that you described. This is what blows my mind too. These techniques are exactly the same for any mind control cult. Like I said, it doesn't matter if you're going down to take a three-day seminar at Landmarks to simply improve your life, you're playing around with oranges, or you're on the stupid e-meter you know, cans in Scientology. These techniques should have been figured out a long time ago, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see the pattern and the, and the ways that these states of mind are induced in. And I actually went to a landmark, whatever it mm. was, because a friend who had done that weekend said, oh, you have to come. I'd like you to come. And this was later on when I was an adult. And she said, oh, you have to come. You know, I get to invite one person. I'm choosing you. You come. Mm -hmm. And I went and it was a bunch of people standing up saying how the weekend was so important for them, mm -hmm. how they broke through yeah. and all these things and they have all these plans and they're going to, yeah. their plan to help the world is this. Yeah. And, 
And I was just sitting there going, holy shit. In fact, one woman said, you know, during the thing, her apartment was burned to the ground because somebody downstairs was smoking or was doing something wrong. And then her whole thing, she went, I'm not angry. I'm yeah. not upset. Yeah. I went, oh my God. Like I would be so angry and upset. My apartment went down. And then, you know, and I think another thing that I noticed about Scientology, they're persistent. Mm-hmm. And I knew that if I gave them my name and phone number, they would be on my ass to try and get me to take a yep. course. So I, I gave them my name, but reversed because I'm not Roy Mitchell. I'm Mitchell Roy. <laughs> I gave them the wrong phone number. So they never bothered me. What I wanted to go into, and this leads into the next question, is you describe in one of your video, the last one I saw, the most le- the latest one, about the book and bottle. And I thought even explaining it was, when you explain it to us, it's so difficult to understand because the language is used to confuse and manipulate. And so using that as an example, can you explain using Scientology language <laughs> what the book and bottle process is? It is super confusing. And like you said, even describing it's a challenge. But they have a thing called a grade chart that you see in Scientology everywhere when you walk in. Another word for that is the bridge to total freedom. So you see all the choruses and the auditing that you're going to be doing on this chart. This is a way of suggesting what the gains are going to be once you do these choruses. So for example, that book and bottle exercise is contained on one of the beginning choruses in Scientology that you can see on the grade chart called TRs and Objectives. As you can tell and what you just said, Roy, is that just saying that alone, nobody knows what the hell that means. So it's already confusing. You have to go to their dictionary to start learning their terms. And so you start to think within these terms after you know weeks and months of doing this. TR stands for training routines, and objectives is another way of saying, we're going to bring you into present time. This is all the mumbo jumbo that these cults promise, and this is the ecstatic experience that you were talking about that your friend had with the oranges. So it's not dissimilar to that at all. Same techniques, just very scientific and confusing sounding, and an entire gray chart of 100 different items or so that you need to do in order to achieve total freedom, which is what you're told at the top. So just by hovering around and seeing this grade chart day after day as you go down and take Scientology's courses, you're reading it and you're seeing all the gains that are available, which are really appealing. Like, for example, if you do the first grade that they have, that is called communication. And the ability that you see on the grade chart that you're promised that you're going to have after you finish that is the ability to communicate freely with anyone on any subject. That's quite a claim, and they have all these amazing gains that you're going to have on this grade chart. So getting back to the TRs and objectives, which is where the book and bottle exercise comes in. So you already have the suggestion in your, implanted in your mind about what you expect the gain is going to be at the end of this. That plays as a part, a part of this process. And what all of Scientology is doing, which is what these cults do, is called covert hypnotism. You're being put into a trance or an altered state of consciousness without your consent or awareness. And it's reframed that it's a special technology in Scientology called processing or auditing. Does any, does any of what I just said make any sense? Because it's very difficult to even talk about. Are you tracking at all with what I'm, what, what I'm saying? Oh, no. When you explain it, I'm going, oh, it's so fucking confusing. It, that's what I'm saying. We're talking about something that makes no damn sense, Roy. So how can I communicate it for God's sakes? That's the challenge I'm having. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't matter. It's not supposed to make sense, right? Like that's that's the point. Right. Uh, right. What I hope people who are listening will realize how confusing it is. Exactly. That's, that's the exactly. that seems to be the point. So it doesn't matter. You could explain this for two minutes. You could explain this for two hours. Mm-hmm. It's fucking up your mind and that's the that's the goal so tell us without going into super detail what happened to you when you did the book and bottle drill so the the process was this i'm standing there side by side with my auditor he points and says look at that book i do and he acknowledges you thank you he says walk over to that book i do he says thank you pick up that book thank you what's its color um blue thank you what's its temperature um, 80 degrees. What's its weight? I would say less than a pound. Thank you. Put that book down. Thank you. Look at that bottle. And then I do thank, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So you go over to the bo- the book and you answer the same questions. What's its temperature? What's its weight, et cetera. So what's the point of all this? Well, you're doing a monotonous, repetitive command 
You're holding someone's focus of attention. That's what hypnosis is. It's simply a focus of attention. And by doing these repeating commands, having your mind focused by the commands of this hypnotist or this auditor, I can tell you from personal experience that what happens after X amount of time, hours, days, weeks of doing this same repetitive, unnatural, mind-numbing process, like I said before, it goes. you go beyond the mind's natural capacity and you will snap into a cathartic or, or amazing trance-like state where you feel like the answers to the universe, revelations that you've never had before, and all sorts of ideas come to you in this state of mind because you're in an altered state of consciousness. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way, which I said in the last videos. There's a lot wrong with uh, giving your mind over to a hypnotist, not knowing that you're being hypnotized without your consent. And then when you're also, when you're in this ecstatic state of mind, they can then implant suggestions. Scientology is great. You need to go see the registrar to give them more money. You start taking in the words on a deeper subconscious level. Everything goes in a thousand times more when you're in this trance. So you're very su susceptible to having false memories and stuff implanted. That's another huge part of Scientology's auditing or processing part. But to keep it simple, this is an introduction before it really gets hardcore as to experiencing this, this cathartic state by cracking your mind. And then you're going to attribute that to a special technology that L. Ron Hubbard told you he invented. This ecstatic state belongs to him. You can only access it through Scientology's processing. And my experience was this was such an incredible high. I did this when I was a child. I've never felt anything like this before. And I was told that I was exterior or outside of my body. So with no other explanation that I was in a trance, and uh, I, hadn't, I didn't know that, I simply had to accept, and especially when you're in the state of mind, like I said, you're very susceptible to suggestion. So it was suggested to me that this is a real technology. I'm out of my body, and this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. That, by the way, at that moment, this is what hooks people and keeps them in there forever. Because until they get another frame of reference as to what happened to them, they're going to be addicted to that high. And Doug, one thing I wanted to point out, you did this drill over mm -hmm. a number of days, a number of weeks, and mm -hmm. you fought back. You were saying, can we stop this? This is mm -hmm. fucking ridiculous. I want, like, you fought back, but they broke you. Exactly. And that's common too, by the way. They know that you're going to fight back. I'm a little more aggressive just because that's just my attitude. But I knew something was happening that was weird. That all changed when I finally hit that moment. I said, oh my God, thank you, Wayne. That's the name of my auditor for, for getting me through this. Thank you for pushing me through this. I had no idea how beautiful Scientology really is. I've never felt this way in my life. So they know that they're going to traumatize you and you're going to want to lead the session. And they have a whole bunch of drills, by the way, where Wayne, my auditor, for example, is trained on how to get you not to leave that session. They know you're going to turn things on. In Scientology, that means you're traumatizing someone. It's, uh, it doesn't feel good. And the way out is the way through, they say. So when you start to say, I want to leave, or I don't want to do this. And like I said, using four, for me, using four-letter words with my auditor, they have ways of handling your considerations and making you keep going through the drill. If you do that, eventually you'll have this ecstatic state, and it's a win-win for both the auditor and you, while you are oblivious the entire time of what the hell just happened to you. Whoa. And Doug, that's crazy. It is, right? I really appreciate you telling us all this. No problem. You made it clear that doing these videos has been part of your healing process. How has that been going? It's been amazing, Roy, to not keep this bottle up and to finally, you know, I don't have a lot of people listening. That's not what's important. Just to be able to say it and put it out there and to have these videos that they're done, they're there. I did them. It's not all in my head. And also I've had a lot of positive feedback and emails and stuff. It's been incredible. People actually say that it's helping them. I got into Scientology because I was told that I was helping to clear and save the planet. I still have that goal, man. I always like, I wanted to help the planet. And that got robbed for me when I realized I would have been con my whole life. And I thought I had to give that up. And just maybe for the first time in my life to be doing a little bit of help or even one person that says that they get something out of just me talking about this stuff. It's amazing, my friend. It's been far more therapeutic and cathartic than I ever thought it, it would be. And it's real healing that Scientology didn't offer. And it feels like possible real help that I wasn't able to, to do before. So it's been incredible, my man. Wonderful. Doug, your last video, the most recent one that I watched, 
ended very powerfully. And I have to tell you, I, I worry about you sometime. From what I've seen, Scientologists can be brutal and mean to people who criticize the organization. I've seen the Leah Remini show. I've read up on it. But you were telling me things about the inside that I had no idea happened. I want to know, how safe are you? I'm fine, man. Do you worry about your safety? No, I don't. It's hard to explain, Roy, but this experience pushed me to a very deep, dark place. So I figure if I can survive that, I can survive anything. Also, it got rid of my fear. So I don't really care. I don't really fear what they do. I also want to say that it depends on the person that you are. I don't want to underplay it and say they don't attack and all that. But we are in a pandemic. Their numbers are dropping. And because of people like Leah Remini, and the exposure that a lot of people have contributed to this, it's a lot easier for someone like me to simply come out and talk and not fear. That doesn't mean they won't do anything. It doesn't even cross my mind, to be honest with you. And if they do, I know what to expect because they train me well. So it's, a, it's not even part of my thought process. And like I said, there's people like Leah Remini and stuff that get hit far more har harder. I'm nobody. They're in the public spotlight. I'm sure they get fair gamed and harassed all the time. And even then, they they just speak out. There's plenty of people doing it, and it's a much, much easier climate because of all the brave souls that came beforehand. Doug, thank you for this. Thank you for all the work you're doing. And know that it is helping people and your openness about your experiences making a difference in people's lives. I'm sure of it. You're great. And in closing, I want to ask you about the Big Lebowski. Because the people who watch this show, your technology <laughs> is minimal. You're sitting at a table, you're talking to them, and right behind your head is this big picture of the dude. <laughs> Why? <laughs> That's a good... Well, my man, like I said, I have no idea what I'm doing. I didn't even own a computer or a television before uh, I started to get into this stuff. So I simply purchased that dude poster uh, a couple years ago, and it's just something I got on my wall. I was looking for a place to, to actually shoot at. And I was like, why not against the dude poster? There was no conscious thought or plan in that. Like you said, it's minimalistic. But I do love The Big Lebowski. It's a great, great movie. And I feel like if there was somebody to represent my own sort of spirit animal or soul, it would probably be the dude in, in that movie. So that, that's, <laughs> that's the explanation of that. Here's another question that has nothing to do with anything. But in the last one, you didn't smoke at all. And people that start at the beginning will notice you are a smoker. And I want to <laughs> know, have you quit? No, I just didn't. I just figured if people aren't a smoker, that could be a turnoff. And I figure out of respect to people that are watching this, I will probably do a heck of a lot less smoking on camera. There's no reason to do that. I think you're, you're amazing. And what you're doing is really important. I, I don't know if I could say that enough. Thank you, man. And in closing, is there anything else you'd like to share, Doug? Well, I just want to say that means a lot to me, man. Um, and I really appreciate you, as they say in Scientology, acknowledging me. I just wanted to say thank you for even caring. The fact that anybody gives a crap about some random dude story and some wacky cult. And for you to say that means a lot to me. So I just want to say thank you for having me on. And I, and I really appreciate you caring, man. Thank you. Mutual, mutual. And in English, we say acknowledge too. So fuck Scientology. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Again, thanks again, Doug. And we'll be talking soon, I hope. Thank you, Roy. I really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you, Doug. And again, check out the links in the show's description for links to the music played and Doug's YouTube page. The energy and style of Doug's YouTube videos remind me of the actor, writer, and performer Spalding Gray's Swimming to Cambodia. Spalding's performance in that film struck me as similar to the simplicity and power of Doug's work. So how fitting that in my search to find music to end him a minute, I find singer-songwriter Josh Woodward's song Swimming to Cambodia. Flicker of a TV and a long forgotten memory are the only things you'll ever leave behind. The dust that's on the floor, there's no one at your door. Now tell me, do you really think you're free? The war is done, my friend. You fought until the end. White flag down Morning, noon, and night You always seem to lose the fight Spalding 
Where the hell are you? The pole of the ocean is set into motion And now you're on your way Today is the day when you're going to swim to Camp Cody Once were little please with the fire of your younger days. You blinded everyone you met. But you never were the same since Dublin's night consumed your flame. It stole the matches from your pocket. The Hudson's freezing, but your brain cells keep on squeezing round the thought that you must swim away today from the Staten Island ferry on the coldest night in January it's Cambodia or bust had feared the man who held you in his hand he controlled you in your sleep but now the end's your friend you're reaching to extend your white flag to the sky you once had cursed the sun is sinking and your frozen eyes are blinking at the cold Atlantic nothingness ahead You take a deep sigh And you wave a passing goodbye And you set your course And swim away The pull of the ocean Is set into motion And now you're on your way Today is the day When you're going to swim Because you're 